Society Girl Saves the World, where we discuss Pakistani movies from the past. This time we're going back to 1987, a film called Lady Smuggler, also known as Lady Smuggler, because on the poster of the movie, the smuggler is spelled S-M-U-G-L-E-R, which is an interesting, uh, perhaps deliberate interpretation of that particular name. The film stars Barbara Sharif, Ismail Shah, Humayun Qureshi, Dolly, Babita, Sabita and Rangila. The film is directed by veteran and unfortunately late director Shamim Ara. Going back a bit, a young girl Putli Bai is born to an Ajmeri dancing girl in pre-partitioned India. This girl turned out to be a tough little cookie. Later on in Pakistan, as Shami Mara, she struggled up the ladder in the 50s and blossomed by the 60s as Sabiha Khanam's successor as the top leading lady of Pakistani cinema of the era, along with Zeba, who may have had an edge in terms of beauty, but was way behind when it came to screen presence and acting skills. A decade later, Shami Mara's career as a leading lady was fading fast as the swinging 60s turned into the hip 70s. And recognizing the writing on the wall and changing times, she decided to hang up her acting boots to concentrate on a career as a director. Miss Ara had already enjoyed massive success producing the film Saika in 1968, a film that was the perfect vehicle to showcase her skills with its Cinderella-like tear-jerking story that saw the film waltzing away with a record number of nine in Nigar Awards, the local version of the Oscar. She started her directing career with Gio or Gine Do and then in 1978 came Playboy which starred Barbara Sharif who would become the first choice actress for a large proportion of her films in the early days. Films that were largely also shot away from Pakistan on location, sometimes in Sri Lanka, sometimes in the Philippines or Hong Kong or even Nepal, often away from Pakistan. She had a checkered career as a director but rolled with the good and the bad times. But then Pakistani cinema in the mid to late 80s was plunging to new depths of violence and crudity, and Shami Mara's style of work became increasingly redundant. Even then, she scored the occasional box office bullseye to keep her in contention, notably the massively popular Munda Bigra Jai, and then came Hathi Mere Sati, starring cricketer-turned-hero uh, Mohsin Khan. Sadly, by the turn of the century, her health was in decline and she suffered a brain hemorrhage which left her in a coma for a considerable period of time until her passing in 2016. But she will always remain a towering figure in Pakistani cinema history. Lady Smuggler was one of Shami Mara's sark jamborees which often meant some concessions from the government that has traditionally cold-shouldered the film industry since SARC, S-A-A-R-C, was supposed to represent South Asian cooperation, the government's involvement facilitates such productions in certain ways because of political goodwill. It also meant that the films could be dubbed into various languages and perhaps benefit financially from markets that would otherwise be unavailable. Lady Smuggler was a Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Nepal production and each nation provided a star or two, though the production was largely in the hands of Shamim Ara. During the opening credits of the movie, the name of Sayyad Noor props up as the brains behind the production having conceived of and written the script. Noor had gained prominence as a writer in the mid to late 70s with Society Girl and had been building on his success ever since until he had become a fairly recognizable entity as a scriptwriter alone. The next step would be as a movie director in his own right. Lady Smuggler is in setup mode until the film's intermission. It's a quite lengthy prologue involving three entirely separate threads of the story, each involving a hapless young woman duped by villainous men, and each of the victims ends up in the notorious Philippines Central Jail, a correction facility full of the usual horrors of prison life. 
Sadly, that aspect of prison life isn't really focused upon on the movie because the second half is largely devoted to the three wronged women, Dolly, Barbara and Sabita, escaping from the facility and tracking down their tormentors until they exact their revenge. Alas, our hero, the honourable cop Ismail Shah, ends up on his own as the sisterhood lives and dies by its own rules. The first victim is a God-fearing young Christian girl. One night at the church, she prays for her Prince Charming. And before she can say Tararamba Karamba, she feels the tapping on her shoulder. And as she turns, her eyes lock with those of a handsome hunk, Mike, who smiles at her graciously. Dear Holy Christ, you know that I want you to ask me to ask you to ask me. In the best pickup line ever delivered, he tells her that God has answered her prayers. She giggles and blushes and within moments they are serenading each other with a whimsical song that has them visiting numerous tourist spots and parks in the city. Clearly, Mike and Sheena are made for one another, and as they gaze lovingly, temptation raises its dangerous head in the form of a torrential downpour of rain, and that has both of them seeking refuge and requiring heat. Mike flies off home to Hong Kong but promises that when he returns he will marry Sheena and a few days later Sheena has a spell and is taken to hospital by a worried father. But disaster strikes as the nurse blithely informs the father of his daughter's pregnancy and being a good upright man he keels over forthwith at the mere thought of his daughter being deflowered before marriage. Your daughter is all right. Here is a happy news for you. What's that? Your daughter is going to be mother. Meanwhile, an increasingly frantic and pregnant Sheena has given up on life as Mike appears to have gone AWOL and she's about to fling herself off a cliff when all of a sudden he reappears, claiming that his mother was very sick, the reason he got delayed. He allays her fears by agreeing to marry her right away, but insists that the ceremony be carried out in Hong Kong, and he asks her to depart with some of his luggage while he finishes off some loose ends and meets her in a day or two later where they will get married. Little does she realize that she has been led down a road that will end in her incarceration in the jail cell she is currently rotting in, while the ghastly Mike is living it up. The second victim is a popular entertainer who gains the affection and unwanted interest of some sleazy and powerful scumbag who sends her a bouquet of flowers with his minion, but when the minion tells her that she must perform for his master, she flings the flowers back in his face angrily, telling him to shove them where the sun don't shine. This doesn't please the crime don one bit. Miss. <laughs> Thank you. Jinu ne ye phool bhijwaye hain. Wo khud bhi aap se milna chahte hain, Miss Fajira. Kis is lemon? Wo aapko pasand karte hain. Mere to hazaaron lakhon fan hain. Main kis kis se milungi? Lekin wo bahut Soon enough, he plans to avenge this grotesque insult he has suffered at the hands of this jumped-up Me Too feminist, and he swears to teach her a lesson she will never forget. He traps her on a boat and has her fiancé murdered. She reacts by grabbing a gun from one of the dozy henchmen and shoots up half the gang while the sleazy crime don slinks away to safety. And then she too is apprehended by the old Bill 
and is marched off to become the latest resident of the notorious Philippine Central Jail. The third victim is Barbara Sharif, who catches snakes for fun and lives in the forest carefree with her father and sister. The local cop, stationed in the forest for strange reasons, has a crush on Barbara and one fine morning appears at their home asking their father if he knows anything about a well-known smuggler called Marcia. Barbara's father looks perplexed and lapses into a flashback to a period of time when Marcia had come to him asking him to throw off the police who were on his trail, but not only does Barbara's father hand him over to the old bill, Marcia accidentally gets into a spot of bother with a dozen or so of Barbara's cobras that he manages accidentally to free. It's not a good day for Marcia, but at least he isn't savaged by the snakes. And now, out of prison and in the present day, the dastardly Marcia is plotting his revenge. Marcia is not going to be arrested. She is not going to be He has Barbara's younger sister snatched and injected with mind-altering drugs and he murders her father in cold blood. A crazed Barbara tries her utmost to stop the villain from getting away but is hindered by the old Bill who much to her dismay, arrest her as the lady smuggler, and she is marched off to the same jail as the two victims, where they gradually form a bond of sisterhood in vengeance, and are determined to right the wrongs that have been forced upon them. The second half of the movie is devoted to the girl's quest for revenge, but fails to turn up the thrills and dramatics, as the utterly predictable climax approaches. Shami Mara manages to pull off a mild surprise with her end, but in retrospect probably added to the film's less than brilliant box office performance. <laughs> the rather tedious and drawn out climax unfortunately fails to build on the reasonable premise and is unable to provide that kick-ass payback finale that each of the victims and the movie deserved. This Shamimara epic somehow lacks that extra spark. Even the stunts and fight scenes are less than exhilarating and rather than pick up steam, after half time the film begins to meander in predictability and doesn't manage to elevate itself with anything extraordinary. Even the songs are rather tame, though one synchronized disco dance choreography was rather enthralling. The acting of the main characters is adequate, but the dialogue exchanges lack that dramatic spark that audiences tend to thrive on. The villains are fairly lecherous, but perhaps not outlandish enough, and nor are their get-ups inspiring enough to make them memorable in any way. A film like this needs to thrive on being over the top, and alas, this doesn't quite materialize, and there's a certain lack of fizz to the bubbly in the fridge. There is a woeful lack of clapworthy scenes to keep the front benchers happy and this lady smuggler is unfortunately a little bit too flat, no pun intended, lacking the oomph, snap, crackle and pop to turn it into something more memorable. Ismail Shah, who was the only male lead of the movie, died at just the age of 30 and his loss was a major blow to the industry as he was immensely prolific at the moment of his untimely demise. Barbara, Sabita and Dolly do their thing but the film lacks that extra to elevate it to the memorable level. In our humble opinion, a rubber crocodile or two, a villain with a hook instead of a hand, an unmasking scene or two, some sword in prison dealings, a sleazy club dance would have certainly helped, but disappointingly that never happened. Lady Smuggler or Lady Smuggler, as it is also known, promised a maheep of fun but failed to deliver. Apologies therefore, a dreadful attempt at a joke at the expense of Maheep Kapoor, of the wretched Bollywood wives. And that brings us to the end of this particular podcast, which was talking about the film Lady Smuggler. We hope you enjoyed the review and that you'll be back for more of the same kind of thing sometime soon. Until then, please be safe and take care. Goodbye. 